personal views and opinions expressed by our podcast guests are their own and are not legal advice or official statements by their organizations. Hello, my name is Debbie Reynolds. They call me the Data Diva. This is the Data Diva Talks Privacy Podcast, where we discuss data privacy issues with industry leaders around the world with information that businesses need to know now. I have a special guest on the show, Walter Robinson. He is the Data Privacy Manager at Janie Montgomery Scott, LLC. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm always interested to see people on LinkedIn who are saying really interesting things or are are in really great, interesting roles. You've had a a long career in legal. You're a lawyer. And I was very interested by your move from compliance into privacy because I see that as very common now. But I would love for you to be able to tell me about your interest in in privacy. Sure. So. I started out as a trial attorney with Allstate Insurance Company a um, long time ago, twenty over 20 years ago. And I litigated cases. Um, and at some point during my career, I began to be a manager, managed attorneys, paralegals, master of assistants, still tried cases. So um, my experience is heavily tilted towards civil litigation. Um, so I tried motor vehicle cases, premises liability cases, subrogation, commercial liability. Uh, and then at some point, about a year and a half ago, I had a chance to take a voluntary termination package. Um, so I decided at that time that it was a good time to make a move into something that I've been interested in for a very long time, namely technology and innovation. Um, Now, at the time, there weren't a ton of jobs out there that sort of tied law and technology together. There were some innovation jobs within uh, the insurance industry. And then I started looking around a little bit more. I peeked into some groups on LinkedIn, and data privacy kept coming up um, whenever I would look at different groups related to technology, technology and law. And then I really started to do some more digging. I'm like, wow, this is something that, that I really am interested in. Uh, and I felt like it was the perfect segue for me at the time because uh, it requires communication skills, it requires risk management skills, which on the insurance side of things I had. In addition, it requires some understanding of technology. I don't think to be a data privacy privacy lawyer or data privacy manager, you necessarily have to have all the technical skills. Like you don't have to have a CISSP necessarily. Um, but I did kind of immerse myself in the tech infosec side of things. And then uh, somewhere around June of 2022, um, I got a call from a headhunter about the Janney position. So I took the role as a data privacy manager, and um, I've been in that ever since. And uh, I've learned so much in that role uh, about obviously data privacy, but also about just how to uh, communicate change to people because part of being any role in privacy is about uh, communicating changes, communicating changes in law, communicating changes in process and practice, and also communicating uh, sort of the culture of privacy. So all those things are important. Um, and I've had a great time so far in my role. Like I said, it's been a year and, uh, I'm looking to learn a a lot more as I go here. Very good. I know a lot of people who are making that transition, people that I've seen in compliance or 
litigation moving over to privacy because they have an interest. Either, you know, they're really excited about all the new regulations that seem to pop up every day or very excited about what's happening in technology. I want your thoughts about collaboration. So in order to be in this type of role, it can't be like I'm in my own little silo doing whatever. You have to find a way to create those bridges with people who are in legal, people who are in those technology roles. So tell me how you found bridging that gap in your work. Well, it's interesting. In my role now, I'm not in the law department. I'm actually in the IT department and I report to the CISA. Um, so it, we have meetings every morning uh, for 8.15 to 9 or something like that. But we have meetings every morning to go over sort of the technical side of things. So that's where I'm learning a lot, too, to go over the threats that have occurred overnight new threats that have come up. Um, so like I said, it's heavily info security. And then sometimes infosec and privacy intersect. Um, and that's always interesting because that's where I can actually chime in. Uh, but beyond just the IT aspect of it, um, I've had to work with heavily with the law department. I've had to work heavily with marketing heavily with HR, especially in light of the CPRA and the changes in California, um, operations. So it's really, you're working across the company, um, not just to sort of uh, keep them informed, but also to stay informed about what they're doing um, and what they plan to do. So you really need to keep your ear to the ground to kind of understand um, how some of the things that they're doing can interplay with privacy laws, privacy regulations, and just you know some of the general privacy principles that um, we talk about all the time. And the other group I forgot that you have to interface with is compliance. Um, and they play a rather large role in a lot of what we're trying to accomplish in privacy. So you really have to be able to uh, tell people sometimes bad news, to tell them, no, you can't do that, um, but still leave a shine on their shoes, uh, which is interesting because as a lawyer, that's also something that you do. As a trial lawyer, that's something that you try to do. You try to sway the jury, right? You're, you're trying to communicate certain things to a jury. I think it's the same thing, trying to communicate either up or down, because there's a lot of communication um, to the executive level, but there's also a lot of communication to sort of the staff level as well. Um, and just trying to get people to understand some principles like data minimization and that, that keeping all the paper or all the data is not necessarily a, a shield. Uh, it can be a liability. So That's true. Tell me a little bit about how you break down silos, because I know from experience working with lawyers, a lot of times, if you're a lawyer, you enter a room with a group, maybe you're working with marketing or HR, people shut down. They don't really want to talk or they feel like, oh, this is like, this person's going to tell me, slap my hand for something I'm doing. So how do you get people to open up and truly communicate and tr trust you in your role? Well, there are a few things. One since I don't um, report up to the law department, I think it makes it a little bit easier to uh, walk into a room and have a, a frank discussion or pick up the phone and have a frank discussion because they know my goal is different from the legal department. Even though I'm a lawyer, my role in privacy is to help them sort of stay ahead of things I don't like to say stay out of trouble because that 
has different connotations, but to stay ahead of things, I think is important. To stay ahead of all these changes to the law. So if you kind of couch it in those terms, like I'm here to help. We have all these changes to state laws coming up. We have changes to breach notification laws that happen all the time. We have regulations that change. Um, and I'm here to help you kind of keep ahead of those things. And people seem to respond to that. I'm not saying that right off the bat, everyone's, you know, super welcoming. But over time, once you prove yourself in terms of why you're there, um, I feel like people do respond favorably. So. And how is it working with the technical people? So privacy has the technical side and it has a legal side. You have people, maybe people like me, who are more technical that you end up working with. Tell me how that relationship plays out. Because the way that I've seen it a lot of times, let's say you're working with someone on your role and you're counseling them, but maybe they're asking a question that may not be in your wheelhouse is more technical in nature. Like, how do you have those conversations and, and how do you bring in these other resources that may be more technical? I mean, I rely heavily on um, our InfoSec team, our NetEng team, um, our security engineering team. They really have the knowledge, the deep knowledge about um, the technology and the bells and whistles and what goes where. Uh, I have been trying to increase my knowledge of those things over time because I don't like going into meetings, not necessarily knowing everything that people are talking about. So that's been great because as they're talking, I can kind of look things up or later after the meeting's over, I can kind of uh, dig around and see what they're talking about. Uh, but in terms of translating things for people, I try to keep it as simple as possible if I, I can. So if I don't have to break things down into technical terms, um, I find it's easier to communicate things that, that way. And also, um, it's sort of more manageable in terms of um, making sure that people understand. So. Very good. What's happening in the world right now that you have your eye on that has a privacy implication that you're saying, oh, wow, I don't know if I like the way this is going? Well, um, chat GPT and AI is a particularly interesting area right now. Um, and it has raised in my mind some very serious privacy issues because I think a lot of people are thinking that they can use it to, to help them get a leg up in their job or to help them perform certain tasks, but they don't think through the privacy implications of that. So, um, you know, if you're taking corporate data and putting it into an AI program, whatever it is, chat GP or whatever, you're, you may run into problems. Uh, and certainly if you're using information that is client-based or proprietary, you're definitely going to run into problems. So in terms of things on the horizon, that's one big thing. Um, in terms of legislation, I'm really excited to hopefully see some movement on federal privacy law. And interestingly enough, I, I was talking with someone the other day about um, TikTok in China and how that, that may be the impetus for um, Congress to pass some legislation this year, uh, because everyone's been talking about TikTok and, you know, to a lesser degree, uh, Twitter and privacy. And nothing's really moved the needle, um, but it seems like now it's at the forefront of people's minds. So hopefully uh, there'll be some movement there in 2023 if movement happens 
it has to happen this year, I think, because next year things tend not to happen in election year. So I think this is the time and this is the opportunity to do something. You mentioned TikTok, and one of the concerns that I have about people being up in arms about TikTok is that I feel like we should use a lot of that energy to try to advance federal, more comprehensive legislation on privacy and not just go after like one application because TikTok is very popular and people have concerns about it with their AI and the things that they're doing. But there are other probably thousands of other apps that use that type of technology also. So I think if you're only looking at TikTok and not looking at this broader scheme of other technologies that are doing uh, similar things, we're kind of spinning our wheels and probably not taking the opportunity to do something more comprehensive that's needed. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, obviously TikTok is not the only technology that is sort of harvesting people's data for other purposes um, or non business purposes necessarily. But I do think that from a political standpoint, TikTok became the perfect fall guy for everything that's been going on. And I, I, I'm actually optimistic. I don't think TikTok is that much more nefarious than Instagram or Facebook or Meta or anything like that. Um, but I do feel like the fact that it's China and we have some political issues with China, may be something that drives Congress to to move this thing. It seems like the president's ready to sign some kind of data privacy legislation. That doesn't seem to be a big hurdle necessarily. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how, how it plays out in the coming year. I mean, the the big tech companies have a big lobby, a uh, big lobbying group. So I'm sure they're going to want to have some say in whatever legislation actually ends up being passed. Yeah. I, the, the White House has been very clear on putting forth things, especially as it relates to cybersecurity. But in some ways, I feel like People feel like cybersecurity and privacy are the same thing. So they think that they're advancing in both. So I would like to see more advancement on the privacy side, not just the cyber side uh, on a federal level. But who knows? We had that ADPPA proposal last year that kind of fizzled out uh, because of midterm elections. And so I think people are trying to pick up the, some of those pieces and try to advance things. But I would love to see these groups that are trying to advance separate bills come together on maybe one comprehensive bill. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, there's been so much movement on a state level for comprehensive data privacy laws, and we that seems to be snowballing. Uh, I think the stumbling block may be that the states, like like California, for example, they have such an interest in they were the first kind of, and they have the most stringent laws in the country. I, I don't think they necessarily want to see the federal government get involved. And there's a lot of pushback there. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it seems as, as if they should be working together, but there's a lot of behind the scenes political stuff going on that seems to slow things down. Um, and it, certainly it would be helpful from a privacy perspective to see some consistency in terms of um, the state laws. Now, it does look like most of the state laws that are, have passed are very similar kind of GDPR-based laws, um, but I guess it remains to be seen if some of these other states that are or thinking about passing privacy laws are actually going to follow suit. Yeah. 
I think the future for us is a lot more state laws. States can pass these laws faster. When I, I guess Iowa was the most recent state to pass a law, right? So I thought, wow, now I can't print this on a sheet of paper now. Like I got to add six columns instead of five. It's like we're going to have 50 columns, I guess. And also I'm seeing that these states are borrowing from these other privacy laws. So They may not be extremely different, but they're different enough to be annoying, have nuances that just make it really irritating. And for me, it it seems like we're moving in in a situation like almost like someone says Carolina barbecue. So we'll say, you know, Virginia style privacy law, and it'll be the four or five laws are more like Virginia or more like California. You mentioned chat GPT. And for me, when I think about chat GPT, even though it works a bit different, I feel like I'm having a bit of deja vu because when things like Google Translate came out, I feel like we were telling people not to put confidential information and not to put sensitive information in there. So when chat GPT came out, I thought like, I thought we told people not to put (laughs) sensitive stuff and confidential stuff on the internet. What is it about ChatGPT that got people forgetting that lesson from way back when? It seems like the media has really hyped up ChatGPT to a level that everyone's interested in uh, what it's about, trying to test it out, see what it does. Um, I think people in general, the public in general, is more cognizant of you know privacy and the sensitivity of certain data. Um, but I I just think people are curious. It's human nature. They want to see what it can do. They've heard that it could be the precursor to the rise of the robots. Uh, they're scared. I mean, it's an interesting time, certainly, to be alive right now because the benefits of uh, chat GPT their AI seem to far outweigh the negatives, but there are a lot of naysayers who are saying, oh, the, you know, AI is going to rule the world in 10 years if we don't look out. I don't believe that. I mean, I believe that there have been a lot of technologies that initially people thought were going to be the end of the world, and turns out that they were great for society and helped us create some great and positive things. So so you don't believe in the evil robot theory? I I do not believe in the evil robot. There was a movie growing <laughs> up in the 90s, RoboCop. Yeah. I, mean, I guess people are thinking this is the beginning of RoboCop. I don't know. It could help out with uh, some of the situations we have with the police and things like that. If we did have robot cops that were programmed to do everything right. So, yeah, I had not ever seen RoboCop until this year. And when I saw it, I thought, wow, so people need to rewatch this movie. One thing that happened in that movie is like this robot, someone programmed it to do something. I think they were supposed to target someone and they couldn't stop it. Right. So, the, the robot kills someone. They're like, oh, it's just a it's just a bug. It's a we'll get it fixed up. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the concern that people have, especially when they watch the movies about things like this, because they're thinking, what if we tell it to do something and it doesn't stop? Or what if we have it do something and it's going to like turn on me? So I think, even though that seems far-fetched in some regards, I think that that is an argument that you need to really think about because what I feel, and maybe you feel this too, just went your thoughts in the media. A lot of times people talk a lot about the benefits, but they don't really anticipate what the harm could possibly be. So my thing is you need to have a balanced view of that. So don't throw it out like, you know, oh my God, this is so terrible. We can't do this. So it's I, I don't know, may, maybe it is people want to be on the fringe of both sides. So one area thinks that things are so great about uh, AI, they don't want to hear anything bad about it. Others think it's like the end of the world. What do you think? I mean, I, I do think that if the United States wants to remain a global power, 
economic power, we can't, the genie's out of the bottle, right? We can't go back. We can't put a halt to it because all our competitors are using it and who knows how they're using it. Now that's the scary part. I mean, who knows how other countries are using it without any kind of guardrails. And as you can see with some things that have happened recently are at least how people th think COVID came about. Uh, you know, we need guardrails. You're right about that. I know. I feel like we need to get on. I don't know if we'll ever be on the same page, but I think these times remind me of the commercial internet. So I remember when people were like, we can't be on the internet. And we know how that turned out. It's like, okay, there are harmful things that happen on the internet, but people use the internet for business and different other things. So I think trying to stop it is not realistic because it's already out there. As you say, the genie is out of the bottle, but we have to find ways to use or leverage these in innovations, especially in ways to create, in my view, more productivity. So the ability to really be a helper to people is really the true way to be able to use AI. But then also, as you say about privacy, thinking about the privacy implications when you're sharing information that maybe you shouldn't. Yeah, and the other concern is people are going to lose jobs behind AI and behind some of this advanced technology. And I think People think it's like jobs at McDonald's or things like that, but I can see where you, you don't need as many lawyers if you have AI looking over contracts. Um, you don't need as many, I don't know, nurses if you have AI uh, reviewing patient charts and things like that. So there are real life issues and impacts to it. And society's going to change a lot over the next 10 years. And it already has. I mean, you look at what's going on in France, and uh, it, it doesn't take that much to push a nice society into kind of chaos. That's true. That's true. You touched a bit on HR, and I just want to talk to you a little bit about the HR changes with the CCPA, because I think it will, even though this is only in California, I think it will have a ripple effect in other states about how they think about employees. So employees typically in the past had not had very many rights around the data that companies collect about them. And so California, they're creating more transparency in that area. And I think it's concerning for companies because they had always thought that they never had to share that information. And now there has to be some type of transparency there. But I think what's going to happen is other states may pick that up as well, especially as people are saying, like, for example, you have a company, you know, you have employees in, in all states. So they are like, well, why do the California people get more information than I do? Uh, what are your thoughts about that? couple of things. Um, so with California, the fact that people have the right to, employees have the right to re request their data, request to have their data deleted, it does create some confusion uh, if you have employees in other states. And I think it's incumbent on companies to come up with a solid process up front based on California that they can use for some of these other requests that are gonna come down the pipeline. So in terms of getting out ahead of it, I mean, it's more than just having a good notice uh, at collection uh, on your company's website or on your career page. You really have to be able to sort of find the data uh, and that's where HR comes in. Find the data, but the, find the other places where that data is, unstructured data. So it's a big, it's actually a big uh, task to comply with California. But I think if companies get ahead of it now, 
um, and they create a good process for California, they'll be in good shape when the other states start to fall like dominoes, which inevitably they will. Very good. Well, if it were the world, according to you, Walter, and we did everything you said, what would be your wish for privacy anywhere in the world, whether that be technology, legislation, human behavior? What are your thoughts? Well, at first I was thinking about a federal privacy law, but that's a little too narrow and probably uh, too uh, self-serving. I think really what people crave right now is transparency. So transparency from companies with respect to how they use your data, how they're getting your data, like are your cell phones and your uh, internet of thing document items listening to you? Like is Alexa listening to you? Is your phone listening to you? It should be transparent when that happens. You should be able to know that if I click on this site, something might be tracking me or listening to me. I don't think there's that transparency level right now. Um, And I haven't really seen anything that proposes to address that. Um, So, yeah, I mean, transparency from companies. And also transparency from the people who communicate about privacy. I mean, hey, let us know if you know something is going on. The quicker you can get it out to people, the better off everyone is. Uh, I'm not really sure if new legislation or new regulation will take care of that. But I do think educating people about what's going on will. I agree with that. I think it's almost like transparency is like the foundation of great privacy. So it's kind of the soil that we need to have and cultivate in order to support all the other things that we do. Because I think when you're transparent with people, they have comfort in what you're doing with their data. They don't have a problem with sharing the data, especially if they feel that that data sharing benefits them. So I think what we've had up to this point is a lot of data sharing that benefit corporations or other people, not necessarily benefit us uh, as humans. And also transparency about how, not only how they collect the data, but how they're using it after they collect it, Um, which a lot of the laws do address, but I don't think they necessarily go far enough in terms of the resale of data, the sharing of data, California is at the cutting edge right now of that. It would be interesting to see how they enforce it, how frequently it's enforced. Um, That'll really tell the tale of uh, how strong the, the legislation is, the regulation is. I agree. Well, thank you so much, Walter, for having this conversation. I'm sure a lot of people who are transitioning into privacy from different roles will really find this really valuable. And also, I love your thoughts about this. Maybe we'll check in in a year or so and see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> C- compare notes and see, see how things turned out. Hopefully there won't be an army of robocops roaming the streets at that time. I hope not. We'll record this and we'll keep keep track of how things go in the next couple of years for sure. But thank you so much. Thank you. Talk soon. Bye. Bye.